host, Michael Founds. Uh, he is one of your coordinating team members. Michael's going to be hosting today and help moderating Q&A. And uh, he has the wonderful job of introducing our two fantastic panelists for today. So Michael, when you're ready. Thanks, Megan. Uh, today, we have two amazing speakers from DWR's Sigmo office. Uh, Catherine is a senior engineering geologist from DWR Sustainable Groundwater Management Office, SIGMO, technical assistance section, and has previously worked at the State Water Resources Control Board and in private consulting. She has a background in hydrogeophysics with degrees from University of Texas at Austin and Stanford. Um, and for Halloween this year, she was a vampire. Stephen Springhorn is a supervising engineer uh, supervising engineering geologist in the Sustainable Groundwater Management Office at DWR. He oversees technical assistance and aquifer characterization activities related to the implementation of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act and California's Bulletin 118. And for Halloween, he was El Nino. Um, so I'm going to pass it off to Stephen to give a presentation first, and then we're going to pause for just a few minutes for questions in the middle do a short poll, and then Catherine will take back over. All right. Well, thank you, Michael, and thank you, Megan, and the LunchMar team um, for this opportunity to present. And thank you, everyone, for uh, tuning in today over your lunch hour. Um, I'll be sharing my slides here and just want to confirm those all look good. Um, yeah, and, and so I'll be tag teaming this presentation, as mentioned, with uh, my colleague, Catherine DeLubeck, and we work in the Sustainable Groundwater Management Office at DWR, and we're doing a lot of exciting work, uh, working with our colleagues at the department, other state and federal agencies, and many um, entities across the state. And so today we're going to highlight some recent flood and groundwater recharge response efforts that were born out of last year's uh, historic water year and are continuing to be enhanced this year. Then talk about how that activity is in the context of our longer term effort of basin characterization at the department. And then the latest and greatest on the statewide AEM surveys uh, that Catherine is leading. So what I wanted to start out with is just a little bit of a recap and then point to where we're headed going forward um, on flood diversion and recharge enhancements. And so I think um, many of you on in the network, the Floodmar network and on this call um, are have been doing a, a ton of work uh, for many, many years on, on Floodmar activities, manage and recharge and all of that. And last year was a unique year as we know, and a lot of action happened and just wanna spotlight some, some of what happened in the context of um, trying to enhance flood diversions and recharge. Um, so if we take a look back, and as mentioned, last year was very historic in the fact that there were a number of executive orders that the governor uh, put down to enhance the use of flood water and recharge it into our groundwater basins. Um, this was coordinated amongst uh, many state agencies, particularly the State Water Board, Department of Water Resources, Department of Fish and Wildlife, and others. And that tra translated into a lot of a lot of water at the end of the day and end of the water year. Um, and so with the uh, tracking, as we are trying to get more and more information about what is happening across the state on recharge, working across state agencies, um, the active known reported uh, flood diversions were over or close to 400,000 acre feet. And our colleagues at the board uh, we're orchestrating and, and taking in that reporting. And that occurred over um, 95,000 acres of land. So that was uh, a very big deal uh, and represents a, a tremendous amount of work at the local level and then working collectively with uh, locals and state agencies. And then there was some other enhancements that the state board uh, really were taking the lead on and trying to get uh, as many of the streamlined permits out the door and building that capacity for uh, flood diversions uh, to happen. And so that was a lot of uh, great work that occurred. And then also longer term, there's been different funding uh, streams, uh, about $100 million over the last couple of years 
through Sigma grants that are creating a lot of additional uh, capacity uh, at the local level by local entities, groundwater sustainability agencies, uh, building recharge basins and or other related recharge related activities, which is adding up to um, bigger and bigger numbers. So all told, a lot of action is happening and um, that's sort of the context for this shorter term effort that occurred last year. So last year, what happened um, during the early part of 2023, as the atmospheric river started to roll in, the snow was falling and building up and the runoff was occurring. And there was the reemergence, as we know, to Larry Lake. Um, there was an advanced planning unit that was set up uh, to really orchestrate the multi-agency and entity response to that event. And in those discussions across the department, across state agencies, there was a lot of um, coordination around what could happen or what needed to happen to minimize flood risk and where possible maximize recharge. And so what was born out of that was the temporary flood diversion and recharge enhancement program or initiative where we were operating in a emergency response um, setting, working with the local districts, groundwater sustainability agencies, the department, Cal OES, um, to deploy and supplement what local districts were already doing for uh, temporary pumps like you see on the uh, upper right part uh, picture, um, trying to maximize diversion of flood water to take water out of the high flow rivers that lessen the impacts downstream, and then put that water out onto the ground, working lands, recharge basins, you name it, um, in a, uh, certain lands uh, to uh, recharge the water. Um, and so the dots, the green dots on the map show the districts where we were working uh, on this uh, very pilot type project that spun up last year. Uh, and this was very focused on the tributaries to the Tillery Lake, because that was a main uh, response action last year. Um, and then the, the orange dots or yellow dots were another type of activity, a little bit longer term, um, but also helps with any successive or future flood event where um, this is where we were helping support locals in clearing uh, agricultural land or land so they could be used for flood uh, diversion and, and layoff areas and also the bet the secondary benefit of recharge. Um, so this was uh, very interesting and, and still um, happening. But again, as this is happening, those acreages are increasing to where flood diversion can happen. Uh, in in this part of of California, so it was it was uh, a very great um, initial effort. We know there's a lot more um, that we can be doing, and we learned a lot. And just want to uh, have you know big shout out to the districts that we were able to work with and worked with us to iron out the kinks and and all of that, and try and and make the most of it last year. Um, so. That was last year, but then that showed the potential of connecting flood managers with groundwater managers and the potential of connecting flood waters to recharge, which this network is no stranger of and has been doing and trying to do for a long, long time. And so I think that's where uh, we are continuing to showcase the and justify why additional funding is needed to do this and this work ne needs to continue. And we were able to get additional funding for this year right now um, to be expanding these efforts um, as we go and, and preparing and being ready for this upcoming flood and recharge season. So where we are headed on that is again, preparing for what's coming and, and the runoff if we do get it. And even there's activities like the, the rip and chip or land clearing that happen can happen even if we don't get high flows this year uh, continue to prepare for when we know we will get them in the future. Uh, continuing to connect to flood manager, the flood manager and groundwater and drought managers, which again, Floodmar has been doing for a long time now, which has been great. So we're building off um, the, the shoulders of that work. And then continuing to track and report statewide groundwater conditions. Um, so then we know the recent Senate Bill 659. Um, put some new requirements in the water code to put out recommendations 
map recharge areas, come up with some action plans on how to continue to maximize recharge. And so we're working internally to uh, coordinate between the two big documents, the California Water Plan Bulletin 160 and California's Groundwater Bulletin 118, and teams come, coming together to share information and advance um, what we know about groundwater conditions, groundwater basins, and recharge. And then in that context, understanding how you know, climate change impacts to certain communities and the state in whole in general, uh, and how these activities can help uh, in that broader um, area of work and planning and action. Uh, and then just continuing to try and connect worlds where longer term opportunities to maximize flood diversion and recharge where uh, there's a lot of hazard mitigation that goes on in the flood world where we have a lot of open available storage space and capacity in our groundwater basins. And so continuing to connect those worlds as we go forward. So that was a, a quick recap of where we've been and where we're going on uh, more near-term flood diversion and recharge, um, which is just one of many um, components of the portfolio of actions that the FloodMar network and efforts uh, have going. But then in, in that context, how does that more near-term effort fit into the longer-term initiative to better understand California's groundwater basins, which are oh, hey, our... So, yep. Hey, so, and it's Catherine. I just was wondering, before we go on to the next section on, um, on basin characterization, do we want to launch the poll on recharge? Yes, that would be great. Yeah, thanks for not uh, saying that before. Yeah, so we, we do have a poll on the recharge topic. Um, just to get a sense of um, what you have going or are plan, planned with recharge, just and we can talk about that in the first break. But what this poll has is what methods of active groundwater recharge does your organization or organization currently conduct or are planning to conduct in the future? So different types of dedicated recharge basins, and you can click any of that apply. Recharge and stormwater basins, some of that occurred. This past winter, uh, we'll recharge on working lands and recharge via unlined canals, ASR wells or injection wells, in lieu recharge, or currently not planning for recharge if they're or not not having capacity to do it. Which is good to know because then we can maybe those are opportunities where we can work together. Um, so we'll let that poll run for a bit um, as I continue on, and then we'll talk a little bit more about that in the um, in the first break. So um, this slide is, is we're, it's sort of a building slide and, and trying to showcase the the landscape of groundwater related information and where where it goes, how it's connected, and how we can build for the future to get more and more information uh, compiled and available on California's uh, groundwater basins, which are our biggest natural infrastructure by far uh, in, the, in the state. So this starts with water code requirements. Uh, for, since about the 1960s, the department has been required to publish what is called Bulletin 118, California's groundwater, um, and provide assistance. We have some new requirements, as we know, that have come in through SIGMA to provide technical assistance for many of you, you all and others to put down uh, or compile and have a better understanding of the basins that you uh, are managing or, or live and work in. And so, and then other higher level water resilience portfolio actions, water supply strategy, administrative documents and direction that really have provided that high level direction and funding to really make this happen, um, which has uh, been, uh, we're in a new era of aquifer characterization as we, as we call it, because of all this action that's happening and funding to make it happen. Um, so the first tier of this is California's Groundwater Bulletin 118. This is the document that's published every five years. And really, this is the archive of the state of the state's groundwater and how it's going on the conditions, management, and understanding. So we'll continue to have this be the repository to put down what is known and also look forward with a vision and recommendations of where we still need to go uh, moving forward. Um, then the middle tier, as we'll talk more about today and the focus of today's conversation is DWR's um, emerging basin characterization 
work. So this is the engine that is going to get spun up to start to generate a lot of new content, new analysis that's going to then inform management or, um, and this is where we're looking for input to make sure that how we develop basin characterization is in line and beneficial for your local efforts of groundwater management. Um, so a lot of this work was done, some of the original basin characterization of groundwater basins back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s was done by DWR, but there was a long hiatus because of lack of resources and different priorities. Um, and so we're really ramping that back up. And a, a big uh, shot in the arm on that was the statewide AEM surveys that Catherine will talk more about. And we're going to ride that momentum into continuing to do more of uh, this characterization work, weave in the AEM data, well completion report data, you name it, sub, all subsurface information, so we can start to get better sub-basin and regional reports, do some in-depth texture modeling, hydrostratigraphic analysis, which then will feed up into informing Bulletin 118. And then not to lose sight of a very important um, effort that has been done for decades at DWR and other state agencies, um, but still needs a lot of care and feeding, and we'll be enhancing the state's data collection and stewardship. So this is really driving at improved access to the fundamental data sets that are out there, uh, which is the new this whole new massive amount of geophysical data and AEM data, um, the OSCAR or online submission or well completion report data. So all of California's well completion reports, uh, California statewide groundwater elevation monitoring or groundwater levels with CASGEM and SIGMO information all going into one spot, uh, and then subsidence, water quality, land use, and the list goes on. But we have received new funding to keep and enhance um, the, the data being collected, and also funding to fund our efforts to uh, use that data then to characterize groundwater basins. And then, as mentioned, access is, is a fundamental part of our strategy. So if we collect a bunch of data, but it's not easy to access, it really, we haven't moved the needle forward. Uh, so we're, we're approaching access in a tiered a manner. So trying to have a specific viewer or um, way to access information for certain audiences. So, and but not have viewer fatigue where there's 20 different ways to find information and, and confuse people. So we're trying to really narrow it down to these four, which are California's Groundwater Live, which is our most public facing or layperson type of viewer for the real time groundwater information. Sigma data viewer, which is our more technical uh, data viewer. Um, and then Catherine will share more uh, and showcase some of the new 2D and 3D data viewers that we're spinning up uh, or viewer. And then the fun, the foundation of all that is open data. So once it's there, it, we can access it, but then you all and others can access it as well. So these are also connected to what are called uh, called California's groundwater subbasin reports. So the subbasin is a very important geography in California, as we know. So we're going to be structuring a reporting system to have the latest and greatest information of in each subbasin as we go. It's gonna take some time, but we're, that's where we're building. And then not to forget about all the great modeling tools that the department and our Sigma colleagues are stewarding and C2B SIM and other, other models uh, that are connected and uh, working in this environment. So this is the landscape that um, we are, find ourselves in. And so now to, we're gonna talk more about what we're planning for ramping up basin characterization. So we're gonna we're gonna we are doing this uh, as I shared in the first slides on uh, flood diversion and recharge. We're gonna have specific questions or direction to go into this realm, not just go in and try and do cool stuff for the fun of it, which it is cool and fun stuff, but do it for a specific outcome or purpose. And so some of those are in this blue box: the primary aquifers, uh, extent of clays recharge identification, surface water groundwater interaction, uh, subsidence uh, challenges or information, um, and then some water quality. And then also importantly, trying to understand how this subsurface characterization can help 
with some of the challenges that vulnerable communities have with dry wells or uh, water sources. Um, and we wanna do this through a community of practice. So we'll talk more about how that's gonna look and spinning up a basin characterization work group. So we have three main pillars of our characterization program that we're, we're uh, gonna be embarking on. The first is continued data collection. So Catherine will talk more about that with AEM and, and other uh, forms of data collection. Then we have um, taking that data, analyzing it, and uh, in incorporating it into derivative products, such as regional, um, or even in some cases, statewide texture models or hydrostratigraphic models, so that we can have, just like a, a surface water, groundwater, or numerical model, a repository for the best available information. But well, we're trying to build that for texture data and subsurface information so that we can use that, locals can use it, whoever can use it, and that'll be the best available information uh, that we have. So it's not scattered uh, as it is now. Uh, and then we need to make sure there's ways to visualize that information. So that's a component as well. But then the, the third leg of the stool, if you will, is data archive and making sure that what we collect, compile and learn gets archived in Bulletin 118 and other sort of a family of documents that are related to that. Um, so now we'll go in at each of these three pillars, a little bit more detail on each one, and then we'll pause for some questions. So continued data collection, as mentioned, and you'll hear more from Catherine, statewide AEM surveys are about 95% complete and will be done very shortly, but we still plan to do some infill AEM surveys, so that'll continue. We're gonna continue to steward and make available all of our authoritative data on groundwater levels, subsidence, all of the rest. We want to build off of what has just been done in uh, about 130 plus basins in the state is compiling the best available information on hydrogeologic conceptual models through the groundwater sustainability plans. Um, so we don't wanna duplicate that work by any means, we wanna build off of it. And then um, we want to then enter into this a little bit more site specific data collection on different pilots. So trying to advance the state of knowledge on how can we use these basin characterization investigation methods um, on groundwater recharge, surface water, groundwater interaction, uh, disadvantaged community or drinking water wells and subsidence uh, challenges or issues. So really uh, having a, a, a pilot on each one of these topics and data collection related to each one of those pilots. So then the other side is public data publication. So making sure what we what we generate we put we get out there in a connected way. So this is some screenshots of most of these are from the Sigma data viewer uh, that we can put a link in the chat. But now we're able to connect Oscar or well completion reports with the statewide groundwater level information. Um, and so in new ways that you can see all of that in one one screen, the latest real time groundwater information with well completion report and some geologic information there. Um, so we are working to uh, publish the data in more intuitive ways, connected ways as we go forward. Um, and then I'll skip this because Catherine's going to hit on this, but just the fascinating and great new data set that we have in AEM and supporting information is really has moved the needle uh, or mo moved the ball very far down the field on uh, our statewide understanding of the subsurface. Uh, and then trying to bring all that, all of those different disparate data sets into one spot to start to do some of this 2D and 3D interpolation so that we can build that best available resource. So here's some different views of different tools, but we're trying to synthesize it all into one or two views of, of 3D resistivity or 3D texture for a large area where you can slice and dice that horizontally, vertically, and start to see patterns that we've never seen before at these scales, which then will lead us to where are the paleo valleys uh, or optimized recharge um, or other interesting features that inform management. So that's a really exciting part of bringing all that together to then put it in one spot to visualize it. Um, 
And then again, we aren't doing this alone. And there's a lot of folks that are already working on this. Um, and so we want to be continuing to collaborate with our federal partners at the USGS, state partners, uh, at part particularly the California Geological Survey and Department of Conservation, our academic partners, and folks that are, have been working on this for many, many years and pioneering different techniques and um, all of that. And then our, our internal uh, colleagues on the FloodMar uh, team as well and modeling teams. So quick on the timeline, we're gonna be um, really bringing these pilots out as uh, Catherine will talk more about. Um, so we are gonna be learning as we go. And then as we learn through pilots, we're gonna be implementing on our statewide level. Um, so we're gonna finish the AEM reconnaissance grid. We're gonna be working on our, our advanced data viewer. We're gonna be publishing what we have in hand by 2025 of California's Groundwater Bulletin 118 document. And we're gonna be building towards the publicly available uh, tools that are mentioned, and then leading all of that, leading to these regional to statewide texture or hydrostratigraphic models, which will take some time, but uh, we're, that's where we're headed. And then throughout all of it is continued technical engagement with you all and others across the state. So we uh, stay in tune with what are the needs out there. And so how we wanna do that is establish a basin characterization work group with our federal partners, academic partners, community environmental partners, GSAs and other local agencies, our federal and state agencies, USGS and Geological Survey, existing recharge efforts that are going on, like the flood mar efforts. And then we have our DWR and consulting team to help be the foundation to bring all those, all those ent entities and voices together. Um, so that's exciting. So if you are interested in being part of this, we're gonna have more information coming out, but uh, please let us know if you're interested in uh, uh, joining this, this basin characterization work group. So with that, I'm gonna pause and um, see if we have any questions and we can look at some of the results of poll number one. And maybe while I'm doing this, Michael, if you wanna tee up a couple questions and we can then pass it over to Catherine for her to go through her, her slides. Yeah, do you wanna start? I posted the results of the poll in the chat. Do you have any follow-up on it? It looks like everyone's involved in several different components of recharge. Yeah, that's great. And yeah, so just, yeah, um, really trying to, that's good distribution of different ways to get water back into the ground, which is great. And um, even the areas that are not planning to recharge or don't have any capacity, definitely want to hear maybe if there's any roadblocks or um, how, how we could get more areas participating or ready for uh, recharge or flood diversion and recharge. Um, so Thanks for participating in, in that in that poll. And I think along the those lines, Daniel Mountjoy had a question of was the land clearing program voluntary by landowners or did the state provide any type of incentives or funding? Yeah, great question, Daniel. Um, it was the state did provide funding to incentivize um, the land clearing. So we we were able to pay for that portion of the work. Um, and this was all done in emergency um, emergency contracting realm uh, because it was very fast paced last year in, in the heat of the moment and the, the runoff and flood issues in response. So there was state incentive and funding and there continues to be that opportunity this year for districts um, to that have, let's say they purchased land to build a recharge basin on, um, we can come in and supplement uh, with helping pay for the expeditious clearing of that land so it, it would bring that land into uh, potential areas for flood water to go if we do have high flows. So um, if anyone is interested in more information about that, please email me uh, because we are actively pursuing additional areas for that land clearing and temporary pump type of work. That's great. I think... Uh... Given the amount of time, I yep. we should move on to Catherine's presentation. Uh, but please keep adding your chats uh, in in the background, and I will be starting another poll while she is speaking. Yes. Okay. 
Thanks um, for covering that first portion, Stephen. And so I'm going to go just into a little bit more detail on, on a few of the things that Stephen covered. Um, and I think the poll should be coming up. And it's just a question for you guys about how you, you have been using the AEM data uh, and what kind of different possible groundwater management applications. So there's um, a, a few options you can choose from, but it'll be interesting to hear um, how you guys have been using it. Okay, so I think we're gonna let that go for uh, a few minutes, then we can look at those results at the end. Um, right, so as Stephen mentioned, um, well, let me say, so I'm gonna first give you an overview of where we are right now with the project and highlight some of the tools that have been developed. And then I'm gonna try to quickly go into one of the, the pilot studies, the, the recharge area, uh, the recharge focus pilot study. Um, <clears throat> so as Stephen mentioned, we're nearly 95% complete with the statewide surveys. So we've got lots of lots of line miles covered. Um, those are the flight lines shown here in green on this map. Um, we've covered uh, 78 groundwater basins. We now have 17 finalized data reports published. So those are complete data sets that are out. Um, we've got 13,500 high quality digitized lithology logs, which are a byproduct of this, of this project. Um, it's something that we're doing to help support the data interpretation. So we've got lots of lithology logs as well as high quality digitized e-logs. So that's just a high level summary of, of what we have available in the project and where we are. And so going into more detail on that, um, we have, let's see, there are nine survey areas that are shown here in color on the survey area map. Uh, and so for all of these survey areas that you see in color, we have complete AEM and data interpretation data sets available. Um, let's see, the one here, pilot study one, the basic characterization pilot study over here in um, the Madeira and Kings basins, that data is still coming out. But if you're in that basin, there is actually a complete data set as a part of the statewide survey available. Uh, and then we're finishing up the surveys uh, this November uh, in the remaining basins here shown in, gr in gray. So over on the central coast, um, down by the Salton Sea, and then up in the Eastern Sierras. So with that, we'll have completed the statewide surveys. So what is this data that we're collecting? I think most folks are already fairly familiar with, with this type of AEM data. We've been talking about it for years, it feels like, but just a very, very quick overview. Uh, with this method, we're getting information about the uh, subsurfaces uh, distribution of, of electromagnetic properties, which uh, typically we display as the electrical resistivity. So blues here are have low electrical resistivity. Materials that are less resistive typically correspond to fine grain dominated materials or materials that have a high concentration of total dissolved solids. Uh, and then these warmer colors correspond to coarse grain dominated materials like sands and gravels. Uh, and so we can cover really large areas quite quickly because the method is, um, is deployed from a helicopter. Uh, so we're covering areas very quickly. We can see down to a depth of about a thousand feet in California and the depth of um, the resolution of of the data decreases with depth. So we have higher resolution in the nearer subsurface and that decreases with depth. We then have the data interpreted for lithology or texture. So this again is a product that's coming out of, of the statewide AEM survey. There are texture interpretations. So as a part of this process, the AEM data um, are integrated or the AEM data are transformed for texture through um, a data transform that's developed using existing lithology log or geophysical log or groundwater quality level data. Um, so then, for example, on the same cross section that I showed before, um, the areas that before were in this kind of bluish color, which were just, this was resistivity, are now interpreted for um, salts and clays. So the yellows are going to be our sands and gravels, and the blues are going to be our silts and clays. So all of this data, as I mentioned, are published or are available, and you can obtain this data set, these data sets from uh, the California Natural Resource Agency Open Data Portal. 
Um, and so for each data set, you'll have a data report. That's the written document about the information. You'll have in that um, the panel so you can view the individual um, um, profiles along the flight lines, things like that. Uh, you'll have the AEM data set. So again, that's the, those are the, the um, electrical resistivity values in the subsurface and also the AEM data interpretations for course uh, fraction. And then there's also the supporting data. So that high quality digitized data is also available for download. Uh, and I just wanted to highlight again, we, well, this is one of the viewers that we have. So we have a viewer that shows you the location of these high quality digitized supporting data. Um, okay, well, there's a link down here. And so you can go through and turn on different data sets just to see within your basin, maybe how much digitized data are there, both the, the e-logs or the lithology logs. Um, and then you can just click a link and download that data set. Within each survey areas, um, I just wanted to, to show you what this looks like. Within each survey areas um, complete data set, there'll be a few files. There'll be the, the, the PDF re data report itself, as well as the appendices to that report. The raw AEM data, now this is a data set that shows um, a change of voltage over time, which most people will not want to use. This is really if you want to work with and reinvert the data, you'll want that. Most of you won't want that. You'll want this AEM data set that contains the, um, the electrical resistivity values and also the course fraction data. We also have, as I mentioned, that supporting data set you can download. And then I also wanted to note that for most of these areas, uh, for these survey areas, we also have an Esri scene layer package available for you to download. And this is just to help make it easier for you to import this data set uh, into your into Arc Pro or into Esri or QGIS or whatever you want to use. Um, there's there's a file here that's been reformatted so you can download it easier. Um, but if you don't want to download any data, fair enough. Uh, we've got lots of ways for you to view the data online. So again, from our um, the California Natural Resources Agency AEM data page. There'll be a link to AEM data viewers. Uh, and we've got an AEM 3D viewer and an AEM profile viewer, which you can access from this single page. So the 3D viewer is, let me see, I've got a video that will describe this, which maybe I'll just go right into. So the 3D viewer will have two panels. You'll have the data in a 3D space here on the left and then a 2D map on the right. That was showing that we were looking at electrical resistivity values. Um, and so <clears throat> with this uh, tool, you can manipulate the data in this 3D space. You can create slices of the data. So this is creating a profile, a vertical slice of the data, and you can slide through the entire data set. And here, I think I was trying to highlight um, basically this aquifer structure that you can see Here's another one, maybe a paleo valley that's that's coming off the Eastern Sierra here. So you can slide through and look at that data um, really at any angle that you'd like. Here's another, um, here's another view showing slice depth slices, but you can create any angle that you would like with this. Okay, and then on the right hand side here, uh, there's more functionality. So when you zoom in, you can start to see um, the locations where we have that high quality, those high quality lithology logs or geophysical logs. It'll give you the ability to download that data set. Um, and then let's see if you click on one of these, you can also, it'll also bring up the profile along that line and you can click a link and you can open that into a full screen. So that is the AEM 3D viewer that you can access. We also have an AEM profile viewer. So this then is a little bit more of a traditional way to look at, at these data sets. So on the left-hand side on the profile viewer, there's a map and the map is showing the average in the top um, 15 feet of electrical resistivity values. And then if you click on any one of these profiles, here's one that's clicked here, um, a large uh, um, attachment here will pop, 
pop up showing you that profile along with the lithol um sorry the lithology logs here's the water levels um and e logs as well if they're available those will be displayed on this profile and hot off the press we just today added the course fraction profiles to this as well. So again, these are the AEM data interpreted for lithology. Um, now this map on the left is showing you the average of the course fraction in the top 55 feet. Um, and then when you click on any of these profiles, again, this map uh, or this, um, when you click on any one of these lines, the profile will pop up showing you uh, the data interpretation along that line. So these are available um, for you to play with. We also have the data available on um, the Sigma data viewer as depth slices. Um, so let me see. So this is along, this is in the hydrogeologic conceptual model tab. Um, we also have on this tab, the electrical resistivity data depth slices and shallow average and then again, as I mentioned, this is the texture data. So this is the interpretation. I believe I have a video of this really quickly. So if you click on this play button here on the left, it's gonna just take you through um, through depth slices. This is again, the percent course of, of the material here. So you see in reds, these areas where we have high percent course over here, where we have some of these paleo valleys um, coming off of the Sierras we have those high percent course materials. So you can click through and play with that. Um, or you can also just look at the, the maps themselves. So this is the, the depth interval in the top 50 feet. So zero to 15 meters. So this is just the average of um, the, the, um, of the course fraction in that top 50 feet. So areas here that are, are mostly reds or oranges, these you have have a high probability that in that top 50 feet, there consists sands and gravel. So these could potentially be good areas to um, conduct recharge. We can add onto this because we're on the Sigma data viewer, we can add on to this layer, the um, USGS's CVHM, this is their Central Valley Hydrologic Model 2 texture data set, which we've added onto here. So you can add this on as well to look at and compare um, how some of these defined coarse grain dominated areas compared to the AEM coarse grain dominated areas. Uh, and then you can add on other layers as well, like major rivers and creeks or local canals and aqueducts and start to think about where you have a system already in place, an so infrastructure, a natural or, or um, or construction or constructed infrastructure to get water from a river into a place that has a lot of sand and gravel in the near subsurface, possibly to enhance those those groundwater recharge capabilities. And I wanted to also highlight that we have those shallow subsurface average maps for the electrical resistivity data and the texture data available to download um, from the Natural Resources Open Data Portal. So everything that we do when we process all of those data sets, we try to make sure that we make those available to you guys so you don't have to do them again. Okay, and then in the last few minutes here, I just wanted to very quickly highlight the groundwater recharge pilot study that Stephen mentioned. Um, so, well, let me first note that with these pilot studies, what we're really looking to do is to answer those Sigma specific related implementation questions and look at innovative data collection techniques and processes and try things, test things out so that they're ready to roll for, for GSAs and, and implementation. Um, so Stephen mentioned we are going to look at the AEM infill um, as well as um, you know traditional techniques, but then also looking at using other techniques like uh, flow tem or toad tem, which is that EM method, but now um, deployed from behind a boat or an ATV, something like that. Uh, so, so we've got three pilot studies that are, are in the queue and this first one on groundwater recharge is ready um, well underway. So I just wanted to highlight that to you guys. So our project site is along the Madeira, is 
between the Madeira and King subbasins, between the upper San Joaquin and Fresno rivers. And there's a few reasons we chose this area for our first pilot study. Um, we have uh, several dry domestic wells. Those are shown here in the dots, um, occurring at very various stages. Uh, we have these incised valley fills that could really serve as great recharge fast paths that um, Graham Fogg and Gary Wiseman had mapped um, many years ago. Uh, and then we also have an active flood mark project with uh, the Eco 15, where they're looking at um, some gravel pits and um, other lake bed type areas along the upper San Joaquin to be doing um, groundwater recharge and habitat rehabilitation and things like that. So we have a lot already going on in this area. We also have AEM data in this area. So when we look at the AEM data, this is the depth interval from in the top 50 feet. So we have these areas of red where we know are coarse grain dominated materials. So it looks like there could be some interesting potential recharge areas here that could benefit some of these communities that have dry wells um, that could also support some of these recharge projects. And because they're along these incised valley fills, maybe get water back into the deeper aquifer more quickly to support um, other people further, other groundwater users further in the basin. So we had a few project goals. One of them was to improve our understanding of the extent of these alluvial fans. So in order to examine that, we collected infill data this spring. Uh, and here's uh, just showing you the flight lines of where that data were collected. We wanted to find these coarse grain dominated areas that would connect, that would that are sort of these individual fast paths to connect um, the surface to deeper down into the aquifer. Again, we used that the AEM method, um, the infill AEM to look at that with some modifications to that method to see in the shallow or subsurface a little bit better. Um, and then we're gonna go back uh, later in 2024, collect some, uh, some totem data. And then we also wanted to understand the type of native native material beneath those river sites to support the EcoFIPS team surface water and groundwater interaction modeling. So the AEM data can support that. And then we'll also go back early next year and do some flow tem or totem or whatever is appropriate at those sites to help support that team in what they're developing. And we just received the data from this pilot study two days ago. So it's, I don't have it ready to show you, but I do have, I did want to share with you um, just one of the, the great things that came out of, of this work. And um, Ian Godschalk from, from Ramball and others will be presenting on this at, um, they presented on this at GRA and they'll present on it at AGU. Um, but basically this is just a, a schematic showing you um, how this new methodology or modified technique that the team used to collect data improved our resolution. So we have our standard method that we use to see deeper under the ground. That can be, the system can be modified to look in the shallower subsurface. And then the team came up with this new, really great modified technique to improve our shallow resolution. So um, it's really things like this uh, that we are looking to be investigating in these pilot studies to think how can we use these existing methods and techniques um, and, and optimize them for the problems we're having in California. And then with that, come out with guidance to support you all in your future investigations. Okay, and with that, I think I'll leave it here with the project website and our email. And again, um, I think as Stephen had mentioned, as we're closing down the statewide AEM surveys, we're just gonna be transitioning all of this work and using the momentum we've gained through this and into basin characterization. So um, yeah, so please, if you if you have comments on, on where this program is going, click this survey and, and share them. Okay, thank you. Thank you both for those excellent presentations. Uh, I've posted the poll results for number two in the chat. I don't know if you had any thoughts on that, Catherine. It looks like, again, there's huge distribution of what people are interested in, uh, how they're applying this new technology. 
Oh, this looks great. It's, oh, I haven't been able to look in the chat itself, but I want to. I wonder, oh, this is, this is great. So we, um, you know, it's really interesting to see groundwater recharge. So I think that got the highest percentage of votes for groundwater recharge. I think, especially where we are in California right now, that is, um, I think, the lowest hanging fruit of where we can use the data because it's so applicable and the data set, um, be because the interpretations are available and what it provides, it makes so much sense to use this data set to support groundwater recharge activities. So that I think is really exciting to see. And some of these other ones like defining extent of seawater intrusion, I think that's gonna be another one that, that um, again, this AEM data set will really support. So we'll see um, where that goes with the future and how we can support you all in, in, in these applications. So great, thanks for sharing, this looks good. And there's no completely new questions in the chat, but Stephen had a bit of a conversation uh, with Christina, and I just wanted to see if anyone else wanted to come off mute and follow up on their questions, or if Daniel had a couple more thoughts on what he was speaking about. Uh, I, I do have one question for Stephen to start out, which is we had that poll question at the beginning of the different types of recharge that everyone's working on. And I'm curious how that was reflected in the actual events that we had this winter of the measured recharge. How, how was that recharge occurring? Where was it occurring? On what fields? Do we have a good picture of that yet? Yeah, I would start with uh, a big shout out to our colleagues at the State Water Board because they, they were the clearinghouse for all of the flood diversion and recharge that went through the uh, executive orders. And so they have a really nice web page and we can put that in the chat that it shows a map of where these parcels were that had applied water and then the estimate of amount of water that was put on these lands. Um, so they have a great resource there. Um, so I think that for specifically for the, the flood diversion and recharge through the executive orders, that's a great resource. But then we know that there was a lot of other recharge that was occurring um, that was through with existing water rights or on ex within existing recharge facilities. Um, so that is a little bit harder to, to find because that happened all over the state with, with where the runoff occurred and where people had water rights to do that. Um, so that's a little bit of uh, where longer term, we're gonna be working with the water board, our plan to be mapping out what we call is ground, uh, California's groundwater infrastructure. So we know where the surface water canals and infrastructure are, but as we know in groundwater, it's a lot more distributed. So the more we can understand where the recharge basins are and how they are uh, how they are recharging and how we can optimize or connect uh, with conveyance or infrastructure to have more of it done. So we're going to be working on that. It's going to take some time, but um, so yeah. So that's just some thoughts on that question. Thanks. Yeah, looking forward to seeing that link. It looks like Christina has a question, and I think you should be off mute. Hi there. Yeah, this is Christina. Thanks, Stephen and um, Catherine. This is always really good stuff. Um, one follow-up question was, uh, you had mentioned that for the pilot studies, you did additional infill AEM. Will there be an opportunity as agencies begin to look at the AEM and use it and say, hey, it would be really awesome if we had one more or two more lines here and here. Will there be an opportunity for that kind of request or fill in um, by DWR to be able to come back and, and do some additional data collection? And then secondly, is bedrock part of the interpretation on any of the viewers or how does that play into um, the AEM interpretation at this point? I can take the bedrock question, then Stephen, I'll leave you the, the other one. So yeah, so bedrock is, inter is not interpreted in the AEM interpretation. If you look at some of those images where you know bedrock is occurring, that area is kind of crossed out. Um, so it's defined as an area that that is bedrock, but it, there's no interpretation for course fraction in the bedrock, but there is a definition of, of that it's there. Um, so the, the interpretation only applies to areas where, um, where we have unconsolidated sands and gravels. 
And then Stephen, I'll leave it to you for the request on infill. Yeah, yeah, and just making sure I I capture it correctly, Christina, is that you know are there opportunities for additional infill, um, and that as we go and as you at the local level um, identify additional data gaps, was that right? Right. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And then I think that connects with a question that Bert had in the the chat as well. But some of the areas that we weren't able to fly for whatever reason, we weren't able to fly them. So that that's really going to be a case by case um, type of process where we have some pilots that Catherine defined. So we have a handful of those pilots that we're going to be going and doing infill and totem and flow tem and all that. Um, but then that's really dependent on how uh, hearing from you and others of what's most important. How is how is that additional data going to inform your local management? and fill data gaps. So I'd say there is a potential, but we we are gonna need to understand you know, how much of that funding we have to do the infill and ground-based work. How do we how do we meter that out uh, according to trying to fill the highest priority data gaps and in, informing in local management. So I think that'd be more of a case by case uh, situation, Christina, on that one. But again, really happy to hear where those would be, how, what that would do, or like how we could sort of get more information about where the where, where that is and details about it. Thanks, both. And I recognize we are at the technical meeting's end, and we've gone a little bit over already. But I do want to get to one last question. Um, and you know, I won't in the chat if people want to keep talking, but we understand that people probably need to go. So uh, last question for now is uh, from Roger Masuda. Is DWR incorporating other AEM surveys into DWR's data that were more detailed than DWR's AEM uh, examples on the Marina Coast, uh, surveys in uh, Northern Salinas and Monterey County? Yeah, I, I can take that one. So in, in areas where uh, those GSAs, where that data was collected privately, of course, we don't have access to that data set. But if those GSAs do um, share that data with us, um, are willing to share that data with DWR, then yes, we will be incorporating all of the data that we have into the analysis process. Um, but again, it's, it's a matter of, of sharing the data with us. Awesome. Thank you so much to our speakers. And I guess I can leave you with one kind of broader question of, it seems like California has been doing a lot with this program and there's been a huge push to characterize the natural infrastructure of aquifers. Are other states looking into kind of either copying this program or did you build off of other efforts that are going on in the world? Yeah, I can touch on that. And then Catherine, please feel free to jump in. And the answer is yes. And so this is, this is, New technology at this scale, it's new. This is new technology for California, but it's definitely not new technology worldwide. And we're working with a great contractor team, as Catherine mentioned, Ramble, and, and many, many others make up the team that we are, are working with, um, and SkyTem. And, and so this technology has been used in um, Denmark, Australia. Um, Nebraska in, in the United States and other states, the Mississippi River uh, area. So it's, and then it's also been pioneered in California by uh, by people like Rosemary Knight and others that have, have done smaller scale um, surveys, but at this scale with the project Catherine's leading, I'd say this is, is new, um, which is exciting because it gets us a lot of, a lot of new insights into many basins across the state. Thanks so much. Any closing thoughts, Catherine? I think I'm about to end the meeting. Thank you all for joining. Yeah, no, that's that's great. Yeah, I think there's a lot of exciting stuff coming out of this um, out of this program and will continue to come in basin characterization. So thank you for the opportunity to share it with this group. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.